Please stand for the reading of God's Word. Today's reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, and verse, or chapter 11, verses 17 through 34. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. In chapter 11, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you, in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal, one goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. Then so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. You may be seated. All right, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all, including those worshiping from their cars in the back, still recovering from surgeries. <laughs> hey, uh, we're starting a new series today, a new sermon series uh, entitled Why Church? Uh, we often, I don't know, around this time of year at the start of the fall and all of our fall ministries and kickoff programs, we often think it'd be, you know, a good time to just kind of spend a couple weeks and just kind of review uh, what we're doing here together, why we're doing it, what it's all about. And uh, we kind of felt like this year, especially after all that was 2020 and all the disruptions of COVID to life and to church, uh, might be especially important just to kind of come back together and just take a little bit of time and talk, answer this fundamental question, why church? I mean, why the church? Why is my own participation in the life of the church uh, something fundamental, something so essential, uh, at least if it's our desire to uh, in our lives, follow our Savior Jesus Christ. All right, and so if you think about it, this is part of what COVID did for us. Uh, COVID shut everything down. It cleared the books. It uh, took everything out of normal life in many ways. Not everything, but a lot of things. And it gave us opportunity to experience life without some of those normal things in their normal ways. And if well, now as everything has started coming back in, you have this opportunity to ask as you're putting things back into your schedule, okay, why exactly am I doing this? Why do I spend time, invest some of our resources or whatever in this? And so, hey, well, let's ask that question about church. <laughs> or what COVID did partly for us too is we learned how to do things virtually. We started live streaming for the first time as a church. Uh, we learned that we can have efficient staff meetings and 
uh, small group meetings without having to wear pants because Zoom only covers this far up, right? So why do I need to come be in person when I can sit and I can enjoy church with my pajamas, you know, and a cup of coffee or whatever? Or I can remember early on when uh, COVID shut everything down and we were having to pre-record, uh, you know, our, our music and also the sermons, and then we would air it live on Sunday mornings at 10 and we're watching it all from our homes on YouTube. I remember thinking, why in the world... <laughs> Given the myriad of options that are out there, why in the world would anybody stay tuned for my sermon here at 1030? Why not, you know, go, go watch Tim Keller or Charlie Dates or Eric Mason, you know, these guys who are online. You can watch their services. In fact, in those early days, I remember our kids, probably when we were watching the YouTube channel uh, videos, they were most watching the counters of how many views are happening, you know, simultaneously. And every time the counter would dip down, ah, they didn't like that point. Or there goes Dick McIntyre. He's going off to watch John MacArthur or something like that, you know. Right, but that but also, also alludes to the day and age that we live in as well, too. Thanks to the miracle of the Internet, man, you can get incredibly rich content, you know, rich Christian and biblical edification, nurturing any time of the week, any time of the day through... Biblical expositors, teachers, lecturers, videos, guys who are far more talented than any of us than, than I ever will be, <laughs> right? So, again, why, why do I need to come? Or I'll, I'll just even mention that even in my own house, I'll come home many a times and I'll hear John Piper yelling from some It's just sort of what John Piper does, but he yells from some room in my house because Amy's listening to him while she's cleaning or now you can actually listen. You can actually listen to people reading sermons of Charles Spurgeon. How in the world is a guy supposed to compete with Charles Spurgeon? All to say, given that, remind me again: why this? Why church? You know, or maybe just, you know, maybe on more serious notes, maybe we all have by osmosis started to, you know, breathe in the air of our culture where we are. You know, all rugged individualists, we pride ourselves on self-sufficiency, on building and maintaining, the ability to maintain a life for ourselves. And in that context, how is church anything more than just a nice religious social club, which is great to put in when we can, but fundamentally I'm not convinced of my need for it. Or if you're a young person here, maybe you have heard the criticisms of church and you hear the voices from the younger generation saying, hey, Jesus, yes, great to have Jesus in your life, but the church, eh, take it or leave it. Okay, that's enough reasons <laughs> to consider why you don't need church. And Some of you are thinking, this guy's making some good points. If I leave now, I can have a, a good tailgate party before the game starts. <laughs> but that's the fundamental question. Why church? Why is church so vitally important, so essential in the life of a Christ follower? Or at least, why are we convicted of that through Scripture? I'm going to take the next few weeks to look at that. Um, and uh, this morning, you're basically getting an introduction to the series, or you're getting the one main overarching answer that I'm going to be going after in this series. There's, in my head, there's one main, very clear, very simple, big picture answer to that question which again is very simple to understand, it's very clear, and yet if it's true, it is dramatically profound, and it has rich implications, and it's that one thing that I'm going after this morning. I could have used a variety of New Testament texts to do that, but I chose, uh, since we're having communion today as well too, to uh, look at the one time Paul actually talks about communion and also highlights this one main point that I'm going after. So we're in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. Right, those passages that Mark read for us, and I just want to talk it through. And there's one verse in particular where Paul almost makes mentions just in passing this one main point that's clear, simple, and yet deeply profound that I want us to consider this morning. All right, so that's where we're going. Let's get at it. Uh, let, let's take the the context here. We had I had Mark read a little bit out of First Corinthians chapter 10, which is where Paul first starts to talk about communion and Lord's Supper. And he's doing it in this context where he's writing to them with certain uh, warnings and admonitions. Uh, if you read through chapter 10, he's mainly going after them saying, hey, avoid idolatry. And part of the reason, or probably the big reason why he's urging them to stay away from idolatry is because that's the playground of demons, essentially. For Paul, you know, 
those nifty little statues to some god or whatever, that, that's not really a thing. But for Paul, there's demonic activity in all of that. And so he's warning his people to stay away from that. And in the ancient world, there were all sorts of festivals and feasts and celebrations and dinner gatherings where you would go and you would celebrate some god or goddess in the pantheon of Roman gods. And as part of that, you would have a meal enjoying food which had been sacrificed to that God. And Paul is saying, hey, avoid that because in that, whether knowingly or unknowingly, you might have koinonia, fellowship or participation with demons. And you should have nothing to do with that. And it's in that warning, in that charge of chapter 10, where Paul compares that to what's happening when we come to the Lord's table. And we have those two verses that we read today, I think it was verses 16 and 17, where Paul says, for consider what happens when we come to the Lord's Supper. Is not the the bread that we break, is that not a, again, the Greek word koinonia, fellowship or participation in the body of Christ? And is not the cup that we bless, is that not a fellowship or a participation in the actual blood of Christ? If you just kind of stop and chew on that, that's actually a pretty profound statement in and of itself. If you come from, you know, maybe more of a high church background, you've maybe heard that, and that's not too unfamiliar to you, but maybe from other church backgrounds, maybe you've thought of communion as just a, I don't know, ritual practice that the church does as an act of remembering uh, the death and resurrection of Christ. But Paul's saying, no, it's actually a little bit more than that. There is an actual fellowship here. And there is an actual participation when we come in faith to the bread and to the cup with the body and blood of Christ. Or in other words, that by the Spirit who ministers to us, there is actual participation in the life of Christ when we break that bread and we enjoy that cup together. Uh, this is why throughout all church history, the church has referred to the Lord's Supper as a sacrament meaning it's an avenue of, of God's grace, or it's an avenue in some powerful, maybe mystical, spiritual way of the life of Christ uh, to us. You know, or as our own BFC articles of faith say, when we come to the table, we are feeding on Christ to our spiritual nourishment and growth and grace. There is something really potent, powerful happening when you come to the Lord's table, Paul's saying. And then he goes on to say, for since there is only one bread, they probably just broke one loaf of bread, probably, and since, since there's only one bread, we who are many are one body because we partake of the one bread. In other words, saying not only are we having some sort of spiritual union with Christ in this, but there is a union one with each other because the same life and nourishment and spiritual food that is feeding you individually is also feeding your brother and sister at the same time. And so there's a union there. He's saying we're almost like uh, you know, twins in the womb of a mother. You know, both feeding off of the life of the mother and in that somehow having this interesting union together. Or just put, just put very simply, why do we call it Communion because it's conviction in the New Testament and the church throughout history, is that when we come together, we are one communing with the Spirit of Christ, and we are communing with one another by that Spirit. Okay? So I'm moving really fast through these rich, loaded theological concepts, but two things to tuck away. Communion, one, communion with our risen Lord. Two, it's communion with one another through the Spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's a couple other things here to point out about this. Then we get into chapter 11. And here's where Paul says, oh, and by the way, while we're talking about communion here, the Lord's Supper, I've got some serious issues with you all. And he says, I hear that when you guys gather together and you do this, there are divisions and there are factions among you. And I hear that when you do this and you celebrate the Lord's Supper, some of these divisions and some of these factions eat to their full And they drink so much of the wine that they're getting drunk and tipsy and whatever. And meanwhile, some people are going completely without and don't have anything. And okay, to understand what he's saying here, you have to either remember or understand a few things about communion in the ancient context. One, uh, when they had the Lord's Supper, it was actually a supper. 
they would get together and they would share a full meal together. And at some, co- some point during the course of that meal, a loaf of bread would be blessed and broken and a jug or a bottle of wine would be blessed and shared among uh, each other. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that you remember in the ancient church, they didn't have buildings like this. So when they would gather together for the Lord's Supper, uh, it would be in their homes. And their homes weren't nice, you know, 21st century suburban homes with nice modern open floor plans. They were smaller homes and smaller rooms. And if you had anything of a sizable congregation, you had to meet in various parts and various rooms throughout the house. Okay? And there's one other thing here that Paul says, if you picked it up. He says, do not, uh, do not you all have homes in which to eat and drink in? Or do you so despise the church and humiliate those who have nothing in the way you come and gouge yourself on the bread and the wine and the food and all that? And most commentators here would think that, well, what's happening in these homes is the same thing that would happen if you went to any other meal in a house in the Roman society back then. You would take your important people, your upper class, you know, individuals, and you would put them in the main gathering room. And then you would put your second, third, fourth class, you know, lower socioeconomic individuals, you would put them in the other rooms around the house. And what you always did in a Roman feast or dinner celebration is that you would start the main food right in that main room with the really important people. And you would let them get their choice of the food that they wanted to take, and they would let them eat it until they were totally full and satisfied, and then whatever was left, it would sort of filter out to the lower class rooms. And there's probably some indication here that that's sort of what seeped into the church's practice of the Lord's Supper. We've got divisions, and you've got certain divisions and factions humiliating those who have nothing, despising the church by gouging themselves, getting drunk on the wine or whatever, and leaving next to nothing for those in the other rooms. And Paul's coming and saying, what in the world are you doing? I can tell you one thing you're not doing, and that's the Lord's Supper. And I can tell you another thing you're doing, you're not doing, is you're not doing church. You're actually despising the whole business of church. Right? Because for Paul, you know, what is the church but this is the collection of people who are equally beggars at the throne of Christ's mercy and love. Or the church is the group of people who together are equally loved and cherished sons and daughters and who equally receive shares of his lavish mercy, grace, and love through his death and resurrection on their behalf. But then the key point, again, the key point is equally. There's no upper class Christians. There's no upper class society within the church. We're all equally beggars, all equally dependent, and all equally lavished in incredible ways with his grace and mercy. And he makes this point, sorry, I'm just kind of flying through the passage here. He makes this point by saying to them, look, I passed along to you what was received to me, that on the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he gave thanks. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after supper, he took the cup and in the same manner, he blessed it and distributed it and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And then Paul adds this line. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Uh, You know, if you were to go up to the, say you're going to leave here and you're going to go to the Eagles game, get up to to the link there just a little bit before the game gets in, you get in the doors, you go get your cheesesteak and your french fries, just sit down at your chair. Just in time for player introductions, everybody starts coming out. The field, the team's rushing out onto the field. Everybody's cheering and yelling. Everybody's standing, and then we're going to pause and we're going to celebrate, uh, or we're going to do the national anthem. And as they're do, starting to do the national anthem, you can't help but you look down on the field and you see a few few players maybe down on a knee, or you see a few players with you know their hands or their fists raised in the air, and without them having to say a word. Without anybody having to give them a mic or ask them what's up, you know what that's all about. And you know that they're communicating something, and they're communicating something very powerful and very poignant. And it's something that some might 
rally around and support them in, and there's, it's some, something so powerful that some might come and revile them for that statement. But the point is, they don't have to say a word. To do it is to say it. And Paul's saying this, this, is, this is what is supposed to be happening when the church comes together and does communion. That to say it is to do it. Sorry, no, to do it is to say it. To do this is to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know, and just to reiterate that point, like some people will read that and say, well, you should always have the proclamation of the gospel whenever you celebrate communion. That may be true, but that's not what Paul's saying here. Paul's actually saying, no, actually, when you do this, you are saying it if you're doing it right. When you are coming together across divisions and across socioeconomic lines and across ethnical differences and all that, and you are celebrating and practicing that union and communion that you have with each other through Christ in a powerful way, man, you are giving powerful testimony to the death and resurrection of Christ in a world that needs to see that. So, again, what is communion? It is communion with Christ. It's communion with one another. And it is powerful communication about the death and resurrection of Christ. And just real quick here, the last thing I have to say about this, because I do think it's important. You want to remember that in the ancient context, communion wasn't a a a once-in-a-while thing. He tacked on to the end of a service or whatever. Communion was central in the life of the church. Every time they gathered for worship, it literally was a communion meal. Like, and that's not me trying to advocate for more communion around here. It's more to say that you have to understand that for the church, communion was the central symbol, the central activity of the life of the church. So what, in other words, what happens in communion for Paul is what the church is supposed to be. That not only is communion supposed to be communion with one another through communion with Christ as we communicate the power of the gospel, But as it is a symbol of the church, that's what the church is to be. The church is to be a rich communion with one another. Through communion with Christ by his spirit. That powerfully communicates the truth of the gospel to one another and to the outside world. Okay? Let me say that again. Essentially, that's Paul's, I think, theology of the church. A rich communion with one another through communion by the Spirit with Christ that communicates in a powerful way the truth of the gospel to one another and to the outside world. Okay, finally, we're getting to my key verses. <laughs> Paul says, so look, when you do this, let, every man, let everyone examine themselves, lest you eat and drink in an unworthy manner. And be guilty of profaning the body and blood of Christ. And then I think it's verse 29. Here's my key verse. He says, so let everyone examine himself and, oh, sorry, for anybody who eats and drinks. Thank you. Anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. There it is. There's my verse. Anyone who eats and and drinks without discerning the body. That's actually my phrase. Without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. So here's my question. What body is he referring to there? What does he mean when he says without discerning the body? Yeah, so uh, some commentators will look at that and say, well, that clearly means, like, uh, that that, that means the body of Christ, crucified and risen. If you don't properly discern that when you come to the table, if you don't acknowledge that, believe that, and trust your life to that, well, you ought not to take of communion. But then there's other commentators who come along and say, well, now hold on a second. If you read it in the context of the argument, uh, he seems all worked up about how we are disregarding one another. Chapter 10, he's already called the church the body, the one body, and chapter 11 is all about the church as the body. So quite frankly, we think it's, no, if you eat and drink without having a loving regard for one another, the body, well, you're going to eat judgment upon yourself. Uh, if you pressured me, I'd probably lean towards that second interpretation. But actually for this morning, it's the uncertainty or the slight confusion or question about that. That is exactly the point I want to make. 
we were driving home from a family outing on Friday night. Amy was reading on her phone the Grace News and came across the title of the sermon. Which body of Christ? Question mark. Exactly. Period. <laughs> and she said, what in the world does that mean? <laughs> but this is it, right? It's that uncertainty or that we look at that and we don't know exactly what Paul's talking about. If he's talking about the physical body of Christ crucified and raised, or if he's talking about the spiritual body of Christ, the church, it's that uncertainty that's exactly my point. Because the thing is, you read throughout Paul, you read throughout the New Testament, and yeah, they talk in equal ways about the body of Christ as the physical body of Christ that was crucified, that was exalted at the right hand of the Father. They talk just as much as they do about the body of Christ as being this, the gathering of his people. So much so that when you read the New Testament, there is this very fine line between the physical body of Christ and the spiritual body of Christ, his people. Or there is a very fine line, almost an indistinguishable line, between the life of the risen Christ and the life of his body, the church. So much so that if you ask me, it's almost impossible to discern in the New Testament where the life of the physical body of Christ ends and the life of the spiritual body of Christ, the church, begins. If you go down here to the... I don't recommend this in any way, shape, or form, so please don't hear me. Kids, don't go out and try this. But if you go down to Delaware River and you grab a cup and you take a, you know, uh, fill a cup of water and you take a sip of the Delaware River over here, you might detect a little bit of saltiness. And that could be a whole variety of things, that don't, whatever. But part of that is because though the Delaware River starts up in the mountains and the Catskills is nice, this nice, pure, freshwater stream, it empties down in the Delaware Bay, in the Atlantic Ocean, you know, right between, what is that, Cape May and, and Lewis, Delaware there. And we're in this area now, Wilmington, Philadelphia-ish, where they call it the, the brackish section, where there's a little bit of a mixture of these two things. So much so that you can't really discern where it is the freshwater Delaware River ends and the saltwater Bay of Delaware, Atlantic Ocean sort of begins. It's, it's kind of a mixture. And that's sort of the picture that I get of this connection between Christ and the church in the New Testament. That it's hard to discern where the literal, physical life of Christ ends and the spiritual life of the church begins. Or in other words, here's the simple point this morning. Simple, I think, but yeah, it's profound. That to deeply experience the life of the church, church done right, is to experience in a powerful way the risen Christ. That's a simple point this morning. <laughs> to experience in a meaningful way through union, relationship, submission to the body of Christ, the church, is to experience in a powerful way the life of and the presence of the risen Christ. And that's really the overarching answer to the question of why church that we're going to be going after. And I'm going to be looking at certain aspects of that through the New Testament as we keep going. For instance, if you want to grow up into Christ individually and grow up in conformity to Christ and to be more like Christ with his help, you need his presence in the church to do that according to the New Testament. Or if you want to meaningfully and effectively go after the mission of Christ, whether it's in your home or whether it's in your neighborhood or your workplace or your communities, with Christ's help, you're going to need his presence as it is in the church. And if you want to stand strong against the attacks of the spiritual forces of darkness, the enemies that rail against Christ and his people. If you want to stand firm under that with Christ's help, the New Testament is explicitly clear, you're going to need his presence in the life of the church. You want to experience the love of Christ when you're going through difficult times, trying circumstances, moments of doubt and frustration. You're going to need his presence through the life of the church. In other words, to clarify the answer I'm going to be going after in these next couple of weeks, if you ask me... Though, yes, you can experience Christ by his indwelling spirit in meaningful and powerful ways on your own at home through, again, the ministry of the spirit or the ministry of the word. 
That seems to me the conviction of the New Testament. That there is no more powerful, more, no more dynamic experience of the sanctifying, testifying, strengthening, and loving presence of Christ than meaningful engagement with the life of the church. Right? There is no more powerful or dynamic experience of the sanctifying presence of Christ, right? That presence that is going to enable you to grow up into maturity and conformity to Christ. There's no more dynamic or meaningful experience of the testifying presence of Christ that will, con- that will speak to your own heart and soul of the gospel and will then go out, radiate from this place, then his presence in the church. There is no more strengthening power. There is no more loving experience through a rich, meaningful and proper union, relationship, and submission to his body, the church. So there it is. There's your main point. If you don't want to hear that breakdown, don't come down next week because that's where we're, <laughs> that's where we're going to start breaking that out. But that does have some really significant implications. I'll give you just a real couple quick ones, an anecdote or two, and then we'll close this up. You know, some implications of this. You want to remember what we always say should be common knowledge, but we have to remind ourselves that when we say church, we're not talking about a building. We're not talking about a worship service per se. That's an aspect of church life, but that's not the church. Or we're not even talking about an institution per se. When we talk about church, we're talking about people who are committed to practicing communion with one another through communion with Christ as powerful communication of the gospel to one another and to the outside world. Right? That's what church is. It's a group of people committed to that. Which is to say, I don't know, you can get up early on a Sunday morning, you put your nice clothes on, you can come here to this place, sing these songs, listen to this sermon, go home, watch the game, and, and maybe, if that's your only interaction with the church, you may or may not have actually gone to church that day. Because again, church is not a building, it's not a place, it's not a service, it's a people that we are engaged in communion with. Right? And so that's what we're always urging people here. Not to just come and to attend, but to come to be a part of it. To come and experience in relationship and communion the presence of Christ in the body of Christ. I think another major implication that comes through clearly in this text is that it, it is possible to do church in a way that is dishonoring to Christ and disgraceful to the body. And so we have to take that warning considerably. Where we need to prayerfully consider that, especially if we're leaders here, whether you're elders or leaders of ministry or leaders of grace groups or prayer groups or whatever, right? There's ways to do church that is not right and it's dishonoring to Christ and to the body. It's always our goal. So we are planning, leading, shepherding, facilitating church, right? That we're always trying to bring people through communion with one another into a powerful experience of the sanctifying, testifying, <laughs> strengthening and loving presence of Christ. So we want to do that well. And we need all of you to do that. We need all of you who are filled by the Spirit, who have been gifted by the Spirit, who have unique passions, abilities, and personalities given to you by the Spirit. All of that is called into action so that we can do this well. Lastly, an anecdote or two. This is why I'm a pastor, by the way. (laughs) I grew up in a pastor's home, and typical Gen Gen X kid uh, went to chart my own path. I didn't want to do the pastor thing just like my dad did or whatever, but it was going, getting older in life and realizing how much Christ had used the ministry of the church in my own life to grow me, to shape me, to convict me, make me who I am. And it was coming to the theological conviction of the power of the church, as it's stated in the New Testament, that said, that kind of got used to you know, lead me towards, yeah, doing this sort of thing with my life. And, and I'll say, too, that though I enjoy teaching and though I enjoy preaching, uh, the stuff that really animates me and excites me is seeing the church be the church together because I think there's genuine power. I think it's the most powerful thing on the planet, if you ask me. And that's what I'm excited to be a part of and to see happen here. On the flip side of that, I'll say through 20, close, oh yeah, 20 years of ministry now, uh, I have noticed... Time and time again, when somebody disconnects from the church and strays out on their own in search of Christianity on their own individual, it almost never fails. They eventually stray away from Christ. 
I can go through a list of names, just right. I can think of people right off the top of my head who have left the church for this reason or other, become disconnected with church and church life, disillusioned with it or whatever. And then sure enough, in a matter of time, actually relatively quick manner of time, they became disillusioned and dissatisfied with Christ and completely walked away from Christ. You show me somebody walking away from the church and it'll be my cynicism or 20 years of ministry telling you, yeah, give it time, that person's going to walk away from Christ too. Or you show me somebody who's not really connected to the life of the church, and I will question how deeply they are connected to the life of Christ. Which is all to just say, it's to throw a caution or warning there for 20 years of ministry, but it's to say, man, this is, again, there's that inseparable link between the life, the mission, the plan that Christ has for you, and the life and the ministry of the church. And it's a wonderful invitation to you that Christ would say, hey, come, be a part of this rich communion. And therein you'll find communion with me. And therein together we're going to communicate the power of the gospel to one another and to the outside world. And so till he comes again, while we wait in times of joy and happiness, in times of frustration and sadness and doubt and struggle, while we wait on our returning Lord, let's proclaim his death together until he comes through our communion together and our communion with one another Let's experience that rich, dynamic life of Christ so that we might grow, and in all things, he would be honored and glorified. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So at this point in the service, we are going to celebrate communion together, so I'll invite the worship team to come forward, and I'll invite the um, usher-type folks to grab the elements. Uh, we're going to set them up on, there's three tables, two on the sides, one in the back, one in the back, by the way. We'll have the uh, gluten-free uh, wafers there. I'll just say that real quick. And uh, so basically what we're going to do is the worship team is going to come and lead us in a song, Almighty Cross. And while the song is being played, if you are feeling led to participate, you can come. You can go to one of the tables. You can grab the elements, come back, and we'll wait. We'll pray together, and then we'll celebrate it together. But let me encourage you, first of all, of what Paul said. Is not the bread we break? Is that not participation, fellowship in the body of Christ? And is not the cup that we bless? Is that not participation in the blood of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ? Let me admonish you that if you don't have regard for the body of Christ crucified, and you haven't entrusted yourself to that, I think Scripture would warn you against partaking. Or if you have something, unloving disregard for a brother or sister, in the church, something between you that you're not yet willing to make right, Scripture would be very clear to admonish you to stay away lest you eat and drink judgment upon yourself. But certainly if it is your desire to entrust your life to Christ this morning, either for the first time or the, for the millionth time or whatever, and if it is your desire this morning to grow in a more God-honoring unity with one another and to make right things that are not right and you need grace and you need help to do that, by all means, come to the table and find the grace that all of us as needy beggars come to the table in need of. And let me encourage you also with what Paul says, that we do this as anticipation of the great feast yet to come. We're proclaiming not only the past, as, but we're doing it as we look forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb that is yet to come. And we will enjoy this without sin, without fear, without struggle. And so we're anticipating all that is yet to come. So again, uh, if you feel led to partake this morning, you feel your need of that uh, as we play and sing together, you're welcome to work your way to the table. Once we've all received, I'll come up and pray for us and we'll celebrate together.